Okay, so good morning, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the class. We are looking at the six perfections. From the six perfections, we have presented the perfection of generosity and the perfection of ethics. We have completed those. And then in our last class, we started with the presentation of the perfection of patience. It's quite an elaborate, long subject, so we didn't finish last week. We know that we have three main um, divisions in terms of patience. So we have the patience of disregard, disregarding any harm that is done to you. We covered this last week. And then we have the patience of accepting suffering and the patience of uh, certitude or conviction um, about the teachings. So we will continue today with the second and the third type of patience. Then after patience, when we finish patience, we will do the next perfection, which is enthusiastic effort. And when we get there, we will go back and look at the foundation of all good qualities to see how those uh, subjects are presented there and then we will return into the presentation of the six perfections look at the last two which have to do with concentration and wisdom that is calm abiding and special insight so uh, we are still doing patience so from the easy path Basically, we have read out the, the passage referring to patience that is quite uh, short. However, uh, we're going to elaborate by looking at the second and the third type of patience. So we will begin with developing the patience of accepting suffering. Okay, so we start with uh, developing the patience of accepting suffering, and that refers to recognizing that suffering and obstacles arise due to previous karma we have created, and obviously through the combination of conditions, and we should be able to bring this uh, suffering of problems into the path. So this is what is referred to as accepting the developing the patience that accepts uh, suffering. Okay, so we talk about developing the patience of accepting suffering. So the, if uh, someone has done mind training or has familiarity with this type of thinking, we definitely recognize that in this life, uh, suffering is something that occurs quite often. It is due to our past karma and it is due to the arising of certain conditions. So one way or another, we have to deal with suffering. And if we can develop this attitude that accepts suffering, this will be greatly beneficial because it would reduce the amount of anxiety and pain that we experience. So one way to think about it is that sometimes when problems arise, there is something that we can do to improve the situation. So if there is something that we can do about this situation, there is no need to experience it as heavy suffering. Other times, it is completely beyond our power or our capacity to change the situation. And in this case, if there is nothing that we can do, then again, there is no reason to become overly upset about the suffering. So just as Master Shandideva says in Bodhisattva's Ways of Life, if you can do something about it, why worry? And if you can do nothing about it, what is the benefit of worrying? Another way of thinking that can help us accept the suffering is look at some good qualities of suffering, right? So, for example, when we encounter suffering and difficulties, that helps us become disenchanted and disappointed with samsara. And that means that it helps us generate the attitude of renunciation. And therefore, it uh, makes us have this strong intention to reach liberation so suffering uh, you know acts as a as a motivator of renunciation another good quality of suffering is that when we suffer actually we lose this inflated uh, idea that we have about ourselves because we feel vulnerable we feel weak and therefore suffering reduces our arrogance and pride other benefits that we can bring in mind is that suffering actually inspires to abandon 
non-virtual and to practice virtual. So how does this happen? Well, when we encounter with suffering, usually we stop and we analyze the situation and we say, how did this unfavorable, unpleasant situation arise? It must have some origin, it must have some cause. And eventually we identify that non-virtual is the cause of suffering. So that makes us think twice about engaging or giving into non-virtue. So if I don't want to experience suffering, I should avoid non-virtue. Similarly, we identify virtue as being the cause of happiness. So you say, if I want to have happiness, I should engage in virtue. So suffering becomes a motivator to engage virtue and to abandon non-virtue. Another good quality of suffering that we can bring to mind is that when we suffer, we generate this personal experience of suffering. And then based on our personal experience, we can empathize with others within samsara who experience similar suffering. So we generate compassion for others. It's easier to relate to the difficulty and the suffering of others. So as you can see here, we have uh, mentioned uh, a few of the good qualities of suffering. So if you bring those into mind, it helps very much to develop this attitude of accepting suffering on the basis that it is beneficial at a certain level. Another way to think is uh, that there are benefits of accepting suffering and start thinking like this. Since beginning this time in samsara, I have strived very hard for the sake of achieving some ordinary happiness or achieving some mundane result. And in my efforts to achieve this little bit of happiness, little bit of mundane result, I actually accumulated quite a lot of negativity. As a result of that negativity, I had to experience uh, suffering uh, for a very long time. However, through these difficulties and suffering that I experienced, I did not establish the well-being or the benefit of either myself or of others, right? So all of this, I endured all this hardship for some very small mundane gain. And here I am trying to establish virtue. And that would be in order to bring about, about the benefit of myself and others. So as, as I try to practice Dharma, to practice virtue, even if I encounter some small suffering or difficulty, I should tolerate it just as I did before for no purpose or no gain. Now I will tolerate it for a great purpose and great gain. Another way of uh, thinking in terms of developing the patience that accepts uh, suffering is to consider non-Buddhists who engage in extreme austerities. They follow a mistaken path. They are misled by a teacher who tells them, for example, that if you torture the body by piercing the body with a trident or jumping into the fire and so on and so forth, so you will obtain liberation. And you see these people who follow a mistaken path enduring great hardship and really it brings about not great benefits. So yeah, also you see like mundane people in mundane activities working very hard, enduring great hardship to bring about, uh, you know, personal uh, gains. So you say, why should I not tolerate and accept suffering for the sake of sentient beings? I'm working for the benefit of sentient beings. Therefore, I should accept it. I should take it on. Mm. Another way to think is to bring into your mind uh, the example of a person who is to be executed. But uh, last minute, they change the sentence and they say, okay, instead of executing you, we will uh, impose a much lighter um, you know, uh, discipline. And uh, let's say we have to amputate your small finger. Okay, so... Of course, the person is going to lose a small finger, right? But, and they will experience some pain in their hand and so forth. But considering to losing their life, this is a small thing. So they walk away from this situation feeling great joy because they say, I didn't lose my life. I gained my life, right? I only su suffered a very small loss. 
So it is like this. We have to consider that right now on the basis of this physical body, I might have to endure some suffering, but on the basis of this difficulty and this suffering, I might be able to completely reverse the entire of samsara. So thinking like this actually minimizes the suffering and makes it easier for you to take it on for a bigger purpose, right? So analyzing uh, with wisdom, with logic like this will allow you to take on small suffering initially. And then as you train, you'll be able to take on bigger and bigger suffering. So when we discuss this uh, type of patience, which is the patience of accepting suffering, it's important to understand that the training begins with accepting some small suffering. When you become accustomed to this way of thinking, then you can take on suffering that is a little bit more serious. And then again, when you become accustomed with that, only then you start to take on uh, like really big suffering, accepting big suffering. So it is a mistake to think that you can start straight away from the heavy or the big suffering. You start from the small and gradually you make your way up. Okay, so we have uh, completed the, the second type of patience, the patience of accepting suffering. And we continue with the third one, which is patience that comes with conviction in terms of the Dharma. So in terms of that, we need to be clear about eight different objects. The first one is the object of your faith, which is the qualities of the three jewels. The second one is the object to be adopted, which is the two types of selflessness. The third one is the object that we desire. And this is actually the great powers of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. The fourth one is the object to be adopted, which is virtue and its results. The fifth one is the object to be abandoned, which is negative behavior, negativity and its result. The sixth one is the object of meditation that is the goal that we want to achieve, which is enlightenment. So the seventh one is the object of meditation that is the path leading to that. And that refers to all the practices and the training of the bodhisattvas, in other words, the six perfections. And finally, the eighth one is the object of uh, practice through study and reflection. And this refers to the 12 branches of the scriptures. So what we need to do is we need to um, apply reasoning, uh, rely on reasoning and quotations, uh, scriptural quotation, and develop certainty about those eight objects. And when we reach that certainty about these objects and say 100% it is like this, this is how they are, and then we think about them again and again, developing single-pointed concentration without seeing any contradiction in them. Yeah. So when we talk here about uh, generating the patience of certitude about the teachings, we see that we have to develop certainty about eight objects. So the first one of those eight objects are the objects of our faith. So the objects of our faith refers to the qualities of the three jewels. So the way that we do this is we rely on logic and reason until we reach that certainty that says, this is what it is. These are, indeed, these are the qualities of the three jewels. All right. So then once we have the certainty, we can contemplate these qualities. The second one is the object to be accepted or adopted, and this refers to the two types of selflessness. So again, what we do is we rely upon logic and reason in and uh, scriptural quotation. We rely upon them in a correct way until we reach this ultimate point of certainty where we are convinced and we say there's no other way. This is the only way that it is. So certainty, this is how we induce certainty in relation to the second object. The third object in relation to which we have to develop certainty 
is uh, the object that we desire. So the object that we desire are the extraordinary powers of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So they have supernatural powers, they have the six perfections and so forth. So by, again, by relying on logic and scripture, we follow this investigation, this analysis, until we reach this final conclusion of certainty. That is, that is for sure, these are the good qualities that I desire to have. The fourth object in relation to which we must generate certainty is the object to be abandoned. So the object to be abandoned here refers to negative behavior. So it, be, it refers to non-virtue and also the results of this non-virtue. So again, we analyze with logic and scripture until we reach that point of certainty, saying, you know, this is what the object of, ab of um, uh, abandonment is. Sorry, I should be talking about the object of, to be adopted, which is virtue and its good causes. All right. So this is what the object to be adopted is, uh, virtue and its uh, result. Um, this is what I want to, this is what it is all about. Okay, so number four was the objects to be adopted and number five is the objects to be discarded. So the object to be discarded is all negative behavior, non-virtue, and the result of this non-virtue. So when we talk about uh, the patience uh, in terms of conviction of uh, this, uh, the object to be discarded, for example, it means that we analyze with correct reasoning and by relying on scripture until we reach that certainty which says you know there's no other way this is exactly what it's referring to these are the objects to be discarded the sixth one is certainty about the object of meditation that is the goal that we want to achieve right and the goal that we want to achieve is enlightenment is buddhahood so we analyze, again, with uh, reason and scripture until we reach this certainty and say, you know, this is the goal, this is the ultimate goal, it's enlightenment, and I understand that the paths that lead to enlightenment. So until we induce that certainty, we have to analyze. Uh, actually, number six and number seven in this list are objects of meditation. Number six is object of meditation of the goal to be achieved, which is enlightenment. And number seven is the method for achieving this. So there are the various paths that are the training that lead to enlightenment. And the last one, the object, is the object of our practice that we obtain through our study and our practice. And this refers to the classification of, the, of all the teachings of the Buddha into the 12 branches of the scriptures. So with each one of these objects, we analyze until we reach this definite certainty, this conviction. This is why it is called the developing the patience of certitude or conviction um, about the teachings, about the Dharma, right? So it includes those eight objects or eight categories. Once you induce this uh, type of certainty, so you reach the point in your mind where you say, that's it, I know it is exactly like this, it, it is not any other way. So once you reach that point of certainty, then again and again you engage this object in meditation single-pointedly. So uh, we have uh, presented here the practice of patience. We say we have three major outlines or classifications. The, patient, the patience of disregarding any harm that is done to you, the patience of accepting harm and or suffering, and the patience of developing certainty in relation to the Dharma. The way that we practice, or it's very helpful to practice, is by looking at the benefits of developing this patience and looking at the shortcomings of anger. As I say, one moment of anger is enough to destroy virtue that you have worked very hard in order to develop over hundreds of eons. So immediately you can see how 
uh, the destructive power of anger that is the opposite of patience. And then you can see how much you can achieve by practicing of patience. So having understood this from the point that you are, you should uh, try to accommodate or as much suffering or trouble that you encounter. So uh, however much you can practice patience at the level you are, you should try to do it. And for the higher levels of patience or practicing patience with more difficult objects, you should generate the aspiration, the admiration and aspiration, right? And make prayers and say, may I be able in the future to practice exactly the way that those bodhisattvas on the higher levels also practice. As beginners, we cannot do all of those practices. So it is very important that we aspire and that we pray to be able to do those things. Okay, so as you can see from the six perfections, we have presented the first three, generosity, ethics, and patience. The next one is enthusiastic effort or joyous perseverance. So if we go to page 36 of the easy path, we will read the passage. So it says, As for the practice of joyous perseverance, whilst meditating on the Guru Yidam on the top of your head, contemplate. I shall quickly attain the complete and perfect Buddhahood for the sake of the mother sentient beings. For this purpose, if then if I were to remain for hundreds of thousands of eons in the Avicii hell, in order to achieve each of the, each of the Buddha's Dharma characteristics, such as the major and minor signs and so on, and to complete each of the bodhisattvas dharma, uh, such as generosity and so forth, without stopping to strive, I shall develop delight and I shall collect in my mind the profound and extensive virtues. Not only that, I shall place all sentient beings on the path of virtue. I beseech you, Guru Buddha, um, Guru Yidam, bless us so that we can practice like this and so forth. So once again, we do the visualization where we have the Guru at the top of our head and then we make requests so that we can practice the three types of enthusiastic effort. We have three types because there is the armor-like enthusiastic effort, there is the enthusiastic effort of gathering virtue and the enthusiastic effort of working for the benefit of sentient beings. So for the first one, the armor-like enthusiastic effort, it says, you know, I have said, first of all, you said your motivation and you say, I want to reach Buddhahood as quickly as possible. And in order to develop each one of the qualities of the body of the Buddha, in order to develop each one of the six perfections, such as uh, generosity and so forth, even if, even if I were to remain in the hell of Avicii for a very long time, no matter how long it would take, no matter how difficult it would be, I would never give up my practice. So this is the first type of enthusiastic effort, the armor-like enthusiastic effort. So you set your mind on something which is uh, virtuous, and then you don't want anything, you will not anything affect you. You remain enthusiastic about this practice. Okay, so uh, we continue now with the second type of enthusiastic effort, the enthusiastic effort of gathering virtue. It begins from where it says, um, in order to uh, complete each of the bodhisattvas dharma. So this refers to the practice or the qualities of generosity and so forth, without stopping to strive, I shall develop delight and I shall collect in my mind all profound and extensive virtues. Okay, so that is the second type. And then in the last two lines, uh, we have the last, which is acting for the welfare of others. And we always conclude by, conclude by saying, please, I beseech you, bless me to be able to practice in this way. Okay, so let's look first of all at the nature of uh, joyous perseverance or enthusiastic effort. So when you focus upon something virtuous, um, 
then uh, enthusiastic effort is having this um, joy, this joy, this enthusiasm for it. And completing that joy or enthusiasm is perfecting the enthusiastic effort. Okay, so we mentioned that in terms of classification, we have three types, and the first one is called the armor-like enthusiastic effort. In Lama Chopa, we have this verse that says, even if I were to remain in the hell of Avishi for countless eons for the sake of one sentient beings, bless me to be able to practice without losing my enthusiastic effort. So it indicates that you know, for the sake of each and every sentient being, I am prepared to experience intense suffering in the hell of Avicii. The hell of Avicii is like the deepest hell or the hell where there is most intense suffering for an extremely long period of time. So this is what gives you, gives the name to this classification, the armor-like. So when you have this armor, it means you protect your mind because you are determined to, to remain with the difficulty no matter how long it would take or no matter how difficult it would get. The second type of enthusiastic effort, which is enthusiastic effort that gathers a virtue, is, uh, has to do with this enthusiasm that you have because you want to develop understanding within your mind of the extensive and the profound dharma. Or another way of presenting it, you want to develop understanding of the practices of the six perfections. So this is enthusiastic effort. And you, you know, you're really joyous, enthusiastic about coming to understand those things. Then we come to the enthusiastic effort of acting for the welfare of others. So this is actually enthusiasm whilst you carry out activities for 11 categories of sentient beings. Remember those came up when we were discussing generosity, right? So in any case, you know, working, having this uh, undying enthusiasm and joyous enthusiasm and effort as you're working for others and as you encourage others also to engage in virtue. When we try to practice enthusiastic effort, it is very important that we recognize adverse conditions, like, you know, what can uh, trip me in this practice? And so the first thing that we recognize is that laziness acts against enthusiastic effort. The first type of laziness that we have to overcome is the laziness of procrastination. So the laziness of procrastination is that idea that I don't have to apply myself to the practice right now. I don't have to hurry to do it right now. Like I've got time up my sleeve. I can relax and I can do it later on. So in order to overcome this first type of laziness of procrastination, the way to think is to think about how short our lifespan is. So definitely we need to consider death and impermanence. We also need to consider what will happen after death, that we will have to experience the suffering of the lower migrations. And also we have to consider how rare and difficult it is to get another physical basis like what we have right now. All of these are subjects that we discussed during the small scope of the Lamrim. So death and impermanence, the suffering of the lower migrations, and the, how the difficulty and rarity of obtaining a precious human rebirth. So they help very much to overcome procrastination. The next type of laziness that we have to overcome is laziness that comes due to attachment to negative activities or inappropriate activities. So to give you an example here, uh, engaging in endless and pointless conversations, all right, spending a lot of time in this activity, or um, engaging in general, engaging in meaningless activities that just give rise to a lot of excitement and uh, a lot of mental distraction. So basically we do those things. This is why it's called negative activities 
Like it's not necessarily non-virtuous, but they are negative in the sense that you're getting caught up in these activities because you have attachment for whatever temporary pleasure they give you. And that means that in this life, you never get the opportunity or the proper time, quality time to practice Dharma. And in terms of your next life, they become the cause for you to experience a lot of suffering. So we have to recognize that we spend a lot of time with, with in these um, inappropriate activities due to attachment to some temporary pleasant, pleasant pleasures right now and this will stop us from experiencing and actualizing the incredible results of the practice of pure dharma so this is how we try to overcome the second type of laziness the third type of laziness that we need to overcome is the laziness of putting yourself down is the laziness of self-contempt so that comes with the thought of Yes, you know, I hear about amazing qualities that the Buddhas have, but how could someone like myself ever develop these qualities? Now, it won't come, not me. These things are not for me. So to overcome these type of thoughts, we need to consider what the Buddha has said. The Buddha has said that even the ants and mosquitoes have within them Buddha nature, and that the Buddha has very clearly said that all types of living beings have within them Buddha nature, meaning they have the potential to become fully enlightened Buddhas. So you should say, well, the Buddha said that everyone, all living beings have the potential to do it. And here I am, I am a human with human intelligence. If someone explains to me what is to be adopted as a practice, what I should abandon, um, uh, I understand it. Why shouldn't someone like me who understands these things, why shouldn't like me be able to do the practice? I can do it. So overcome this laziness of self-contempt. Another way to think is that all the Buddhas of the three times who have become enlightened, in the beginning, they started being like ourselves. They were not perfect from the beginning. They started without knowing, without understanding, and little by little, they developed along the path, right? So they practiced, they practiced gradually, and they developed their practice, and they reached where they have reached. So they were like me in the beginning. They didn't know. They didn't know how to do this. But if I can see from the example, even Buddha Shakyamuni, right? He initially was an ordinary being like myself, but gradually he developed and reached the state of enlightenment. So why should I be able to also do the same thing? Gradually eliminate my negativities, gradually develop along the path. There's no reason why I cannot do it. Okay, so again, it's like this. We, in order to develop our enthusiastic effort, we have to consider the benefits of enthusiastic effort and the benefits of overcoming the three types of laziness and also to consider the faults of not making the effort to overcome laziness, the faults of not developing enthusiastic effort. So eventually we will be able to generate this enthusiasm and this joy for any type of virtuous activity. And we should begin right now from the level that we are at according to our capacity. Even though we're not capable of practicing according to the way that you know advanced bodhisattvas can do, nevertheless, we should have the aspiration and make the prayers and say, may I be able to practice in the near future just as they do. Okay, then we continue with the next one. We have already covered generosity, ethics, patience, enthusiastic effort. Number five in the list is meditative stabilization or concentration, all right? So in the easy path, it says, as for the practice of meditative stabilization, whilst meditating on the Guru Gidam on the top of your head, contemplate. I shall quickly attain the complete and perfect Buddhahood for the sake of the mother sentient beings. For this purpose, I shall cultivate all classes of meditative stabilization of the conqueror's children. They are classified in terms of their nature in mundane and supramundane. 
in terms of their orientation in calm abiding and superior insight and the meditative stabilization that is the union of these two in terms of their function in meditative stabilization of the physical and mental well-being in this life the meditative stabilization that serves as foundation of good qualities the meditative stabilization that accomplishes being's welfare i beseech you guru hidam bless us so that we can practice like this and so forth so again it's the same way of practice we visualize that with the guru at the crown of our head we establish motivation by saying i want to reach a state of buddhahood as quickly as possible and then we make the request and say bless me to be able to practice all types of concentration and having made that request we have the visualization of the descent of uh, nectar and blessings as before So as we can see here in the easy path we have different types of um meditative stabilization so it says in terms of nature we have mundane and super mundane concentration so mundane is the meditative stabilization that you find in the mind stream of an ordinary being and super mundane is meditative concentration that you find in the mainstream of an arya being arya being means someone who has obtained the path of seeing and beyond all right so obviously the benchmark is the path of seeing if you have not obtained the path of seeing you are an ordinary being and therefore whatever concentration you have is mundane concentration if you have the path of seeing and above that you have super mundane concentration then it is in terms of their orientation we have three we have calm abiding we have superior insight it's a special insight and the third one is the union of calm abiding and special insight so in terms of orientation here it's a, again you know it's another type of nature like you can have concentration that is calm abiding you can have concentration that is special insight you can have concentration that is the union of calm abiding and special insight then we see there's another classification we which is in terms of function and again we have uh, three types the first one says that it is meditative stabilization for the physical and mental well-being of this life so for example we know that if you cultivate calm abiding you develop what is called the physical and mental pliancy and that physical and mental pliancy comes with a sense of bliss so it is well-being of body and your mind in this life okay another function that we can have is meditative stabilization that becomes as the foundation of good qualities so the foundation your meditative stabilization can actually support the development of qualities such as for example higher perception clairvoyance and so forth or um miracles the capacity to perform miracles um or you know have the abilities of those bodhisattvas who are on the high ground and so forth so all of these are based on concentration and finally we have the meditative stabilization that accomplishes the aims of other sentient beings again it we have mentioned those 11 categories of sentient beings so you have a meditative stabilization that works to bring about the benefit of these beings okay we continue with the easy path for the practice of wisdom so once meditating on the guru yidam on the top of your head contemplate I should quickly attain the complete and perfect buddhahood for the sake of the mother sentient beings for this purpose I shall cultivate all classes of wisdom of the conquerors children such as the wisdom realizing the ultimate the science of the mode of abiding the wisdom realizing the conventional the science of the five areas of knowledge and the wisdom realizing how to accomplish the being's welfare i beseech you supreme guru yidam bless us so that we can practice like this and so forth so we see here that we have a threefold classification of wisdom we have the wisdom of the ultimate it refers to the wisdom realizing the ultimate mode of existence emptiness 
then we have the wisdom of the conventional, the five sciences, and then we have the wisdom that is capable of uh, working for the benefit of sentient beings. So as before, we have the visualization of the guru at the crown of our head, and basically we say, I will train in all the types of wisdom that bodhisattvas develop. This is what I want to do. Please bless me to be able to be successful in that. And then we visualize the descent of nectar and blessings that allows us to be successful. Okay, so as we can see here, we have uh, done the initial presentation of the six perfections. So this comes under the outline that says how to train your own mind, developing the six perfections or engaging the practice of the six perfections. And we know that after that, we have a, a specific presentation of the last two perfections. So we expect to see a more detailed presentation about calm abiding and special insight that will come further, further down the text. But here we had an initial presentation of all the six perfections together. So that was the first outline. So how to train one's own mind for the benefit of one's mind in the sixth perfection. And then we have the second, the practice of the four ways to gather disciple in order to ripen others' mind. All right. So um, as we say here, the next one is the practice of the four ways to gather disciples to ripen others, others' minds. So whilst meditating on the Guru Yidam on the top of your head, you contemplate, I shall quickly attain the complete and perfect Buddhahood for the sake of the mother sentient beings. For this purpose, I shall draw all sentient beings through generosity. Then with eloquent speaking, I shall refute with logic their flawed views and I shall take care of them. Furthermore, I shall encourage them to practice what I teach. And finally, I shall practice consistently with what I, I teach to others. I shall set all sentient beings on the path that ripens and liberates independence upon this virtuous method which accomplishes the being's welfare. I beseech you, Supreme Guru Hidam, bless us so that we can practice in this way and forth. Okay, so here we do the same visualization with the guru at the top of your head, but we make the promise and we to engage in the four ways of gathering disciples. There are four noble methods of taking care of the mind of others. So we request that please bless me to be able to practice in this way. So for this four ways of gathering disciples, the first one is generosity. And generosity here is from the point of view of teaching, explaining the Dharma to them, right? Uh, so the, anyway, the first one is practicing generosity. Sorry, the first one is practicing generosity, as explained before. The second one is speaking eloquently, right? So we talk with a pleasant speech in a proper way. And um, we cut off, you know, any misconceptions that they might have about the practice and so forth. The third one is to work for their aims. And that means that we are setting disciples to work on the aims as they have been taught or involving them in correctly taking up these aims. So you have taught something and you want to encourage them to practice this thing. And the last one is consistent behavior. So according to the things that I teach and I ask my disciples to practice, also I should practice in the same way myself. So these are the four ways of, practicing, of um, gathering disciples and we request blessings from the guru to be able to do so. All right, so let's look at, in a more um, in more depth into those four means of gathering disciples. We say that the first method is generosity. Okay, so that means that you're very generous, you're making presents and so forth. Why do you do this? It's because you want to please them. Because ultimately what you want to do is you want to teach them, you want to tame their mind. 
And when uh, people are, have a pleased mind, it's much easier to stay around, to stay around and receive teachings from you and so forth. If they are displeased or if you discourage them and so forth, if you're not inviting in another way, in other words, um, they will not stay around. So the, that's why the first one, the first step is to practice generosity. You do this to please them. Once you please them and they're sort of like attracted to you for this way, uh, then it says you teach them in a pleasant way. So teach them in a pleasant way can be uh, interpreted in many ways. So actually it has to be applied in many different levels. Okay. So uh, teaching in a pleasant way definitely implies that your expression, like your, the expression of your face and the words that you use and your general physical demeanor has to be like um, pleasant, friendly, enthusiastic, all right? Uh, you have to bear in mind here that you are dealing with people. Some people, they are very beginners in the path. Their mind has not mature. You have other people who are much more mature, uh, much more advanced. You have some people who are careless. You have some people uh, who are confused, right? So although your speech has to be pleasant, uh, you have to eliminate any sort of like impatience or any negativity from your motivation. But at the same time, you have to address the level that the students are. So you have people who I would say as immature. So you have to speak in a way that is beneficial for them in the short term. Right now, this is all that they can see. You have others that are advanced. So you must teach them in a way that will be beneficial for them and talk, tell them about future benefits. You have those who are careless. So pleasant speech here has to be a speech that will make them become aware that they must be very careful. We have those who are confused. So your speech must be a speech that eliminates their doubt, their confusion, and so forth. Okay, Num number third is working at the aim. So working at the aim here is trying to establish the aim, so the purpose of those students. You can establish the end of this life by explaining to them or giving them ideas of how they can be successful in this life, how they can increase their wealth, their resources, uh, how they can improve in, you know, in their, their living conditions and so forth in this life. You can also give them advice uh, in terms of establishing the aim of the next life. Uh, explaining to them how they can become ordained and so on and so forth. We can, you can give them advice that can establish, uh, that can be beneficial for the aims of both of this and future lives, meaning that you can um, help them in mundane and super mundane manners. You can help them uh, accommodate you know, accumulate or create a root of virtue. And then you can show them how they can share whatever uh, virtue or whatever resources they have created. So, for example, someone has become rich and then you encourage them to practice generosity with their wealth and so forth. So instruct them about what they can do with their root of virtue. Um, and then, of course, you have to teach according to the mental capacity of the students. Some will have lesser mental capacity, middling mental capacity, supreme mental capacity. So teach them accordingly and make them engage in practice that is appropriate for their level. The last one is called consistent behavior. And that refers to your own behavior. So it says that your own behavior, your own practice must be consistent with whatever you teach to others. Actually, when you ask people to do a certain practice, you must demonstrate that you at least do this and ideally that you do even more than this. In other words, that your ethical standard, your standard of practice is even higher than what you advise them to do. If you cannot do that, then it's pointless giving other people 
advice and say you should practice this you should practice the other whilst you don't do it yourself okay so this is consistency of behavior the fourth one okay so um as if you remember the general outlines of the text we have how uh, to train in the six perfections in general and then the second outline was how to train in the last two perfections in particular for the first one how to train in the six perfections in general um, we had two we had how to train in um, the ways that benefit your mind which is the six perfections and how to train that will benefit others which was the four ways of gathering disciples now when we give the general presentation right this is always presented in terms of preliminaries the actual practice and the conclusion of the practice so what we have just finished here is the actual part of the practice so then after that, we have the conclusion of the practice. And if you look at the easy path, it says the way to practice the conclusion is as before. So the way that we conclude our, our session is always the same. We make um, uh, dedication prayers, aspiration, dedication prayers, and so forth. So nothing changes here. So as you can see here, the text does not elaborate. And then having finished the meditation session, we move into the period which is in between or after meditation session. So it says here, regarding how to practice during the intervals between sessions, as mentioned above, one should study commentaries expounding the great profound and vast conduct of the conqueror's children. So here the meditation subject in your actual session was how to practice the six perfections and how to practice the ways of gathering disciples. These are the practices of the Bodhisattvas. So you have spent all this time meditating on this and it's important when you come into the period in between sessions, not to waste all this energy, all this good work that you have built up. And if you start looking at irre irrelevant texts and reading or watching all sorts of other things, you just break up the continuity. So it is very important that you don't waste the practice. And in between sessions, you continue to consult with texts and commentaries that speak about these practices of the bodhisattvas. Um, all right. Okay. So now we're going to go into the foundation of all good qualities to see how the material is presented there. It has been a while since we looked at the text, so let's uh, try to reconnect. Okay, so um, so it says, having well understood that the kind master is the foundation of all excellence and that following him correctly is the root of the path, bless me that I may rely on him with de deep respect and repeated effort. Um, up to the point of um, having attained a firm understanding of this, bless me, that may always be careful to abstain from even the slightest ill deeds and to acquire the complete store of virtue. That's a small scope. Uh, and then we have done also the middle scope. So one characteristic of the foundation of all good qualities is that it's a short text that allows us to do, um, to request for blessings like all together of the entire path. If you see the first verse, having well understood that the kind master is the foundation of all excellence and that following him correctly is the root of the path, bless me that I may rely on him with deep respect and repeated effort. So the first one is the proper way to rely on the teacher, having understood that the teacher is the foundation of all good qualities. And we say, may I be able to rely upon him with correct thought and correct behavior. So we are requesting for the blessing to be able to do all of this together. Having relied upon the teacher, then the next thing that comes is how you actually train your mind. And you train your mind according to the practices of the individual of the small scope, the middle scope, and the great scope. So then we have verses 2, 3, and 4 
that present how you do the practice according to the individual of the small scope. Now that for once I have a, f a favorable life, f favorable life form with freedom, knowing how very difficult it is to attain and its great potential, bless me that the thought to take such advantage of it day and night may be born in me continuously. May I remember how death quickly puts an end to the life, as fragile as a bubble on the water surface. And how after death, black and white karmas follow as our shadow follows our body. Having attained a firm understanding of this, bless me that I may always be careful to abstain from even the slightest ill deeds and to acquire a complete store of virtue. So with this, we come to the end of the practices according to the individual of the small scope. Mm -hmm. So... Um, remember that uh, what we have to do is uh, we need to identify the precious human rebirth and uh, from that we need to be motivated in order to extract the essence and once you are motivated to extract the essence you will want the, there is the actual way of practicing in order to extract the essence so first of all we identify the characteristics uh, so in verse number two, you will see it's all about the precious human rebirth, where it says, now that for once I have a favorable life form with freedom and knowing that it's very difficult to attain it again and its great potential, right? So it's saying it has freedom, it has endowments, it's very difficult to get it again, very rare, but it has a great potential. So now that I have all this, bless me, that I can take advantage of this. So we're requesting the blessings all together to, be, to have that motivation to do something with this life. Okay, so the actual verse 2 is the exhortation, making you understand how important the precious human rebirth is. But the actual practice that is in accordance with the individual of the small scope come in verses three and four. So it says, May I remember how death quickly puts an end to the life, as fragile as a bubble on the water's surface, and how after death, black and white karmas follow as our shadows follow the, our body. Having attained a firm understanding of this, bless me that I may always be careful to abstain from even the slightest ill deeds and to acquire a complete store of virtue. So you see there is a reminder of death and impermanence and after that there is a presentation of the law of cause and effect. With this understanding of law of cause and effect, we want to be very conscientious, we want to be very careful that we avoid any negativity, even the smallest negativity, and that will build up our accumulation of virtue. So you can see with verse 4, we complete a section that is practicing in accordance with the individual of the small scope. Then we have two verses, 5 and 6. When indulged in, samsaric pleasures cause dissatisfaction and induce suffering. Having understood their drawbacks and their in unreliability, bless me that I may strongly aspire to liberation's bliss. So as you can see here, it is talking about developing the mind that is seeking liberation. Uh, having seen that samsaric pleasures do not bring satisfaction, they are not stable and so forth, we develop disappointed, we become dischanted disenchanted with um, cyclic existence and begin seeking for liberation. The next verse, number six, with great watchfulness, conscientiousness and remembrance drawn from that pure aspiration, bless me to make the vows of personal liberation the core of my practice for they are the very root of the teaching. So once you are, you are inspiring to reach liberation, you are seeking for the path. What is the path that leads to liberation? Is the three higher trainings. And the three higher trainings, or the foundation of this, begins with ethics, morality, right? So take the vows of personal liberation to be the core of my practice. And on top of that, I will, bring, I will build... 
uh, they practice concentration and on top of that, the practice of wisdom. So this is the practice common with the individual of the middle scope. Right, so uh, following that with verses 7, 8 and 9, we will look at uh, the path of the individual of the great scope. So the first, and we know that in this path, first of all, we have the way to generate bodhicitta, and then the second outline is how to train after you have generated bodhicitta. So verse 7 refers to the way of the method or the way for generating bodhicitta. Having seen that, like myself, all beings, my mothers, have fallen in the ocean of cyclic existence, bless me that I may cultivate the supreme spirit of enlightenment and take full responsibility for freeing all sentient beings. So now we develop great disappointment and great concern seeing that all mother sentient beings are suffering as a result of negativity they have created in the past. And we are motivated to do something in order to liberate them. So here we generate the mind of bodhicitta and this verse includes both methods, the method of the sevenfold cause and result method and the method of equalizing and exchanging self for others. So this is how we come to generate that intention that says, I will reach the state of Buddhahood in order to benefit all mother sentient beings. So this is how we generate bodhicitta on verse 7. However, just to generate bodhicitta is not enough. We must follow this by taking the bodhisattva vows. And after we take the bodhisattva vows, we must engage in the actual training of the bodhisattvas. That includes training in the six perfections and in the four means of gathering disciples. So all of this is presented in verse number eight. The spirit of enlightenment alone cannot lead to Buddhahood unless one trains in the three ethics. Bless me to truly understand this and to practice the Bodhisattva vows with great enthusiasm. So as you can see, we're asking for the blessings all together. We're asking for quite a lot of things, right? Not just to generate bodhicitta, but also take the vows, then train in the sixth perfection, train in the four ways of gathering disciples. So that, that's why we say it's collect, collected con, uh, blessing. The last one, verse number nine, is specially training in the last two perfections, the come abiding and special insight. So bless me that by quieting attractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzing the ultimate truth, I may quickly realize in the path that unites meditative serenity and special insight. Okay, so uh, then we continue with verses 10, 11, and 12. It says, once by training in the common path, I have become a suitable vessel for the vehicle supreme amongst all vehicles. Bless me that I may easily enter the fortunate one's excellent gateway to the Vajrayana. So having gone through the basic training of renunciation, bodhicitta and correct view, once you have fully trained so that you have induced some experience within your own mind stream, then you're ready to enter the supreme vehicle, which is the tantric vehicle. And the way that you enter is through requesting and receiving an initiation. So this is the gateway. Initiation is the gateway uh, into the Vajrayana. Then when absolutely certain that keeping the vows and commitments pure is the basis of achieving the two kinds of realizations, bless me that I may guard them with my life. At the time of the initiation, we receive vows and commitments. We receive the Bodhisattva vows and the Tantric vows. And it is absolutely crucial that we keep all these vows and commitments because they become the basis for attaining any CDs. In terms of the cities, we have the common and uncommon. Uncommon is also referred to as the supreme city and it refers to Buddhahood. In any case, any realizations, any powers, any cities that will come can only be developed if you properly guard vows and commitments. And saying, having understood that nothing will come of my practice if I don't guard them properly, bless me that I will practice them, I guard them even at the cost of my life. And then, having correctly understood the key points of the two stages, 
the heart of Tantra, bless me that I may practice them energetically without ever neglecting four session yoga according to my master's instruction. So, uh, having received the initiation, giving, keeping vows and commitment purely, uh, I will come to understand the two stages of Tantra. This is the generation and the completion stage. And having understood this, may I be able to maintain this practice of having four sessions of Guru Yoga or Deity Yoga um, on a daily basis, energetically. Okay, so we had the three verses here regarding tantric uh, practices, and then we come to the last two verses, 13 and 14, that as you can see is the dedication. So that the spiritual masters who thus show the good path and the Dharma friends who practice correctly may live long, and that all inner and outer obstacles be completely subdued, I pray for you to bless me. So we have performed meditation here, starting from the beginning, the proper way to rely on the spiritual teacher, all the way up to achieving the state of a non-learner's union, which is the last state in Tantra. So we dedicate all this virtue that our teachers and all those who practice the Dharma have a long and stable life. And then we continue, in all my lives, may I never be parted from my perfect masters, and may I practice the glorious Dharma. Once I have fully achieved the good qualities of the paths and levels, may I realize the state of Vajradhara. So final dedication, uh, saying about myself, may having understood and having practiced all these points, may I be able to gradually progress along the grounds and the paths, and reach the end goal of the path, which is the state of Vajradhara. So this is the final dedication, the final verses of dedication in the foundation of all good qualities. So as you can see, this text is very short, but by relying on this text, you can do a very quick bullet point uh, revision meditation in, on all the subjects of the Lamrim, starting from the proper way to rely on the teacher, and that is the first subject, all the way to the end, which is the state of non learners union in uh, Tantra, right? So this is why we say that this text is a very good way of performing like a condensed, brief, but all-inclusive meditation. Okay, so Gesha says, uh, we went a little bit over time, but... We have covered, we have finished this section of the general presentation of the six perfections. We did the correlation with the foundation of all good qualities. So that's very good. We tick this out. And now we can look with a bit of leisure the remaining two perfections, which is about concentration and wisdom, calm abiding and special insight.